Well, I want to offer an initial welcome to all who are joining us in this webinar of the Wycliffe Scripture and Theology Colloquium. My name is Ephraim Radner. I teach theology at Wycliffe College, and I am one of the organizers for this event. We've been doing the Wycliffe Colloquia now for almost a decade, bringing together texts and themes that relate scripture and theology in some kind of intrinsic manner. In normal times, we meet twice a year, in the fall and in the spring, and the event is a full day of talks, panel discussions, question and answers, uh, with some nice food shared in between. But in these less than normal times, we've chosen nonetheless to continue the colloquia, but in an abbreviated virtual webinar form. And we are very delighted you can all be a part of this. Uh, we're grateful to Terry Spratt and to Steve Huco for orchestrating the technological side of this webinar. Uh, if there is a glitch, please be patient. It won't be their fault. It'll probably be mine that I've press the wrong button or the Canadian FCC is after me or something like that. So just be patient, we'll get everything back in order. Today's shorter colloquium is special for two additional reasons besides the nature of the times. First of all, there's the topic, the future of Old Testament canonical interpretation. Canonical interpretation is probably most closely associated with the work of the late Brevard Childs of Yale University. Childs sought to restore what is, after all, a longstanding tradition in a central way of reading the Bible, but he framed it in a very sophisticated way within the critical disciplines of the present. His writings were widely influential and shifted biblical interpretation, at least at an academic level, in some very profound ways. In part, Child's work informed an essential thread of our Wycliffe Colloquia from the beginning. One of the initial organizers of the Colloquia, Professor Christopher Seitz, was a student of Child's, and he is himself considered a preeminent practitioner and elaborator of canonical interpretation. Another initial organizer, Daniel Driver, now at the Atlantic School of Theology, wrote what remains, I think, the best study of Child's intellectual project. But of course, times change. Seitz was a generation younger than Child's, Driver is a generation younger than Seitz, and all of us are facing new contexts and challenges in how we interpret scripture. So the question does arise whether canonical interpretation has a future, and if so, what? And both question and answer touch our own uh, very deep commitments. So we're going to hear a brief talk from Professor Seitz on the topic, followed by a panel of distinguished scholars in response. And then there will be a brief time, all too brief, I'm afraid, of question and answer involving some of you, uh, facilitated by Professor Mark Elliott of Wycliffe College and the University of Glasgow. This will bring us perhaps around the 90 minute mark to the second special aspect of today's colloquium. And that is a presentation of a volume in honor of Christopher Seitz. Not that Seitz's intellectual vitality or productivity are at an end, certainly not, but his career has reached a level of maturity as it were that deserves recognition. So the volume published by SBL Press will be presented and you can be introduced to its contents written by scholars from around the world, some of whom are with us today. And you will see a few greetings from them. We'll close the webinar after that, but there will be the opportunity to be part of Zoom uh, socializing conversations as you wish following that. And you'll be all sent a Zoom link, a different one from the webinar uh, uh, shortly. So with this introduction, uh, let me now turn to Bishop Stephen Andrews, principal of Wycliffe College, who will welcome us formally and offer a prayer for our afternoon. Thank you very much, Ephraim. And I do, on behalf of Wycliffe College, want to welcome you to our Autumn Scripture and Theology Colloquium. And as uh, Professor Radner has said, I'm Stephen Andrews, the principal here at Wycliffe. Well, I regret that I'm not able to welcome you as usual to the beautiful halls of the college, one of the 
benefits of moving the event to an online format is that more people are able to join us in this important conversation. As of this morning, we have nearly 200 people registered. And I want to say a special word of welcome to our panelists and to Professor Seitz, and to say how much we look forward to thinking about the future of Old Testament canonical interpretation, as well as to offer our gratitude to Professor Seitz for his considerable work in this area. Now, it may be propitious that in parts of the Anglican and Lutheran churches, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church, this is the Feast of St. James, the brother of Jesus, witness to his resurrection, and leader of the church in Jerusalem. His attempt at the Council of Jerusalem, described in Acts chapter 15, to discover what new thing God was doing through a rereading of the prophets and Torah stands as an early example of the church's hermeneutic. This engagement of past and present, of elder and newer, is at the center of what we're about at Wycliffe College. In our task of reading scripture theologically, we are seeking to hear the voice of him who gave utterance to the whole canon, and we pray for grace to respond in adoration and obedience. And with that, I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer. First in the words of the Collect of St. James, and then in a prayer for every theological college. Let us pray. Let your people, O God, continually cherish the memory of James, who was a pillar in your church, supporting its witness to the resurrection. And grant that following his example in the work of reconciliation, we may bring all who are at variance and enmity to peace and perfect unity in your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty Father, grant that our schools of theology may be homes of faith and fruitful study, and that all our students may so learn truth as to bear its light along their ways, and so learn Christ as to be found in him, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. So we will begin uh, our formal presentations and we turn now to Professor Christopher Seitz first of all. Since more will be said about Professor Seitz later, let me here simply identify him as Senior Research Professor of the Old Testament at Wycliffe College, having served in previous professorial positions at Yale University and the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He is the author, as we all know, of numerous books and articles on Old Testament criticism and interpretation. Professor Seitz, welcome. Unmute, there I am. Am I on? Terry, unmute myself, there I am. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for all the work. I'll say a little bit more about that, about the volume. I know how much effort goes into projects like this. Um, it's a challenge uh, to know how best to organize a response to the question of, of the future of a canonical approach. I'm tempted to quote Amos, I'm neither the son of a prophet nor a prophet, and the topic is a wide and broad one. Much depends, I think, uh, on the context in which the qu question is raised. You can find considerable enthusiasm for a canonical approach by name or derivatively in certain North American circles. I think this is due in part to the way it dovetails with synchronic reading, narrative approaches, maybe read a response. Also, it appears to be a congenial alternative for those who have had difficulty squaring historical critical reconstruction with their traditional Christian views of Holy Scripture. In that sense, I think the future is positive, if diffuse in character. It may also be a bit differently directed than the formulation of Childs or myself. 
the fact that we both have turned canonical interpretation in the direction of biblical theology and the long history of interpretation, a move not particularly in evidence in North America, is worth consideration, and I'll come back to that in a moment. First, some general remarks. Continental scholarship forms much of the backdrop for my own investments in diachronic reading as preliminary to canonical evaluation. I suppose in that sense, Childs and I share a common heritage. Canonical interpretation has found in recent decades congenial allies in Europe in Rolf Rentorf of Heidelberg, and for different reasons, Willem Buchen in Belgium. And I've argued that canonical reading is where Gerhard von Rod and Martin Note were headed. I've sought to identify convergences as well in the stimulating work of Paul Beauchamp. The Catholic scholar Ulrich Berg in Bonn speaks of a diachronically reflected synchrony, and he signals his appreciation of canonical readings in his own work. One could think of the work of Jean-Pierre Sonnet in the Pentateuch or Jean-Marie Hours in the Psalms, all of this in the continental context. Childs himself saw lots of congenial reception, oddly enough perhaps, in the work of German Catholic scholars, Christoph Dohmann, Thomas Sudding, the late Eric Zenger, and of course, Joseph Ratzinger, who in his Jesus of Nazareth cycle commands an, a, a canonical approach. The reshuffling of a confident three Isaiah model for interpretation, such as many of us were raised in toward an evaluation of the book as a whole is indebted to suggestions made by Childs and taken up myself in work in the eighties. This doesn't represent a rejection of, in of that approach in favor of synchronic reading, though there were phases of that. The famous three Isaiah scaffolding remains, but it now functions more vestigially as attention shifts toward how the 66 chapter book makes sense of itself. Yet for all that, the new big Forschung zum Alten Testament, the more Seebeck and Oxford volumes on Isaiah which assemble contributors 30 fold, while not festivals of diversity, showcase very, very different models for reading, as is somewhat typical of our season of inclusivity. Some more traditionally critical, others interested in metaphor and reader response models, others focus on ancient Near Eastern background, a final section on Isaiah in Asian and African reception. An issue for a canonical approach is the degree to which one must still reconstruct the concrete socio-historical backdrop as decisive for interpretation, either as that which is all that must be said or as that which takes us to the final form. Joseph Blenkinsop in his Isaiah commentary does not believe the final form of the biblical text is an intended theological presentation but must be diachronically recast because that is all interpretation is ever about. So we have a spectrum running from social historical emphasis to the discovery of successive levels of redactional supplementation toward a canonical approach, which believes these exist, but they defer to the final presentation. It is the text, not themselves, that is being prioritized and passed on. The final editors are, as it were, the first readers, and the text carries forward on its own after that. I use Isaiah research to open my remarks because it is an example, I think, of a success for canonical interpretation, but it also reveals a diversity of, of approaches all the same. And more again on this in a moment. Now, terminology, canonical reading, canonical interpretation, canonical exegesis, canonical hermeneutics. These terms are reflective of a direction Childs sought to underscore. But as we all know, the term canon has had a bumpy ride. 
North American scholarship hears in the word canon material matters, matters of order and scope and arrangements and closure and wider books in circulation that for various reasons are not in this or that canon. In the early church, however, the word had more to do with theological hermeneutics. One God, two testaments. And the refusal to deal in progressive or developmental terms as more foundational. The God of Israel is the one God, is the father of Jesus Christ, is the triune God. So the rule of faith in Irenaeus, most famously. Childs published in 1979 his introduction to the Old Testament as scripture, and he only formally used the word canon in the title of his 1984 New Testament introduction. This may suggest his own sense of how the term could be open to misunderstanding, and here I think he was right. For all that, the term canon and the discussion about it has been fruitful as well as exasperating. The danger is in people pressing the material side without sensitivity to the theological side, as well as in making closure carry a weight the term does not want or need. It may be that canonical forms of interpretation are now in vogue, but do not want to use the term for this and for other reasons. Now I wanna work through the Pentateuch, the uh, prophets and the writings in very brief compass to give a sense of what's going on in canonical interpretation. The longitudinal source idea, going back to Wellhausen and others, has demanded that it be taken as a kind of uh, point of bearing for serious thinking about the Pentateuch or Hexateuch. In mo most of our, of my generation, our classical training, classical four source JEDP forms of that insistence carry on, though chiefly in North American circles. The continental scholars tend to date the levels of tradition to a late post-exilic period, and they disagree over the character of supplementation, contestation, or disputation regarding what is now called the priestly writer and the non-priestly writer. The disagreement entails scholars who need to agree about the disputed terrain being decisive, all the same. So big volumes are produced with contributors from North America, Europe, and Israeli contexts, each said to be chiefly interested in this or that dimension of the approach, but they need to be brought together all the same because of methodological confusion. In my most recent book on convergences, I try to show how Gerhard von Rod and Martin Note, von Rod in particular, the premier theological Old Testament scholar of his day, were far more interested in dealing with the merger and conflation of levels of tradition, as these are productively at work in the final form. Childs took that kind of interest and carried it through to evaluating the significance of each of the five books of the Pentateuch as theological accomplishments. Rolf Rentorf did much the same thing from his perspective. What we are witnessing, I think, today in contemporary Pentateuch research is competing accounts of sources or levels of tradition and how, how far they may be thought to extend. So the terms Pentateuch, Hexateuch, and Neonatuch are all raised. And it's as though the final form of five books is incidental theological and of no serious interest as ingredient in the canonical presentation, except perhaps at entry and exit points here, Genesis and Deuteronomy take center stage. Missing is a model which can successfully explain the five book form from the ground up. Rentorf's model, I think, was conducive to that but the field has chosen to return to longitudinal models in which the main levels are post-exilic and the history of religion dominates. I wanna read a brief quote from Martin Note, which surprised me because of the way in which 
he already was moving in this direction in 1948. He writes, the question of whether the combination of sources has not resulted perhaps unintentionally in unexpected narrative connections and theological insights, and hence whether in the final analysis, the whole has not become greater than merely the sum of the parts. Therefore, thenceforth, this literary whole has been read as holy scripture and has been used in worship. Thus, it has exerted a historical impact and has remained right to the present day as the only concretely given reality. Therefore, it is also the task of scholarship to take into its purview this totality in the form in which it has been transmitted. I think most of us think of Martin Note more for his model diachronic reconstruction than for his really, in some ways, rich theological uh, remarks at the end of that book. I have appreciated some frank commentary recently from Pentateuchal scholars on the in-house character of their work and a sociology of knowledge question about just what all the labor is really about. Von Rod, Childs, Rentorf, Note had a larger, had a sense of a larger, I think, churchly context in which their work was to make sense. But instead of that, the worries that are now being registered are more about reputation and dogmatic pedagogy. On the problems of ongoing instability and method, listen to the remarks of Brainer Alberts. He writes, because of the paucity of external evidence and the high number and complexity of internal exegetical and historical data, the discussion seemed to be influenced by unconscious prejudices and ideological limits, which are difficult to clarify. And he writes, observe from the outside, this kind of dispute appears to be strange and may even damage the academic reputation of an institution and see where his worries are. Coming at the problem from a slightly different angle, Thomas Romer in Switzerland introduces a recent essay on the Pentateuch with these comments, quote, Teachers convinced of the importance of introducing their students to the question of the formation of the Torah in historical critical perspective today find themselves confronted with a very uncomfortable situation. The current debate makes it almost impossible to present a consensus on the question without coming across as somewhat demagogic. He then proceeds to give a hopefully non-demagogic solution to the diachronic puzzle. It's hard for me not to conclude that the problems are resident in the method and its expectations for resolution. A more promising approach, I believe, is that of Jean-Pierre Sonnet. Does the Pentateuch tell of its own redactional genesis? And even more recent work from Eckhart Otto. Prophets, let's move to the next portion of the canon. I just mentioned my, my own work. I have just mentioned work going on in Isaiah at present. The canonical form of the 66 chapter book is now worthy of our scrutiny and evaluation beyond the three Isaiah model. Single authors are now assigned to cover the whole book. A lot has changed since my own time in writing commentaries in the 80s and 90s. In his 1979 Old Testament introduction, Childs treated the individual minor prophets, the 12, in canonical order. That is beginning with Hosea, followed by Joel, and ending with Malachi. This was in contrast to the Amos to Jonah sequential model, still popular in textbook treatments. He was not, however, questioning the sequential model or setting up a hard alternative. Rather, he was concerned with the individual witnesses themselves as coherent in the form we have them, including arguably later redaction and supplementation. For this reason, he just works on the 12 in the order they come to us in the Masoretic text. It would be fair to say that right behind Isaiah, in terms of newer approaches, is work on the Book of the Twelve. 
Like Isaiah, some are more invested in diachronic precision, plotting serial redactions, others purely synchronic, the divine character development across the 12 and the like. I produced a book on the topic in 2007 in which my main aim was to suggest that the chronological model had limitations that were built in. And I was no longer able to justify it in basic introductory Old Testament courses. The subtitle of that book, Towards an Introduction, indicated its provisional character. I went on to write a commentary on Joel and various essays, individual essays, in which this different approach was showcased. I also tried to focus on the theological portrayal of the 12 book collection and certain trans historical movements that could helpfully explain trends elsewhere in the, in the canon, including the Pauline letter collection, 13 individual letters in a given order. That remains then Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I wrote my dissertation on these works and I tried to describe the canonical shape of Jeremiah in an essay early in my career. At the time, the reigning commentaries, Bill Holliday, Robert Carroll, William McCain, Ron Clements were all appearing and they could not have been more different to the point of methodological confusion. I'm not sure that situation has changed much. Perhaps in the Q&A, we can pick up other insights on this. One could see a similar kind of divergence in the commentaries of the day, those of Walter Zimmerle and Moshe Greenberg on Ezekiel. And finally, the writings. By its very nature, the third division of the canon is a miscellany. This also partly explains why it has been recast, either in terms of minor reshuffling in Jewish circles or in the, in the relatively late newcomer familiar to us in printed English language Bibles, where the Ketuvim, the writings, have become historical books aligned with kindred witnesses from the former prophets, and the poetic books ranged alongside one another, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, the so-called lyrical books. A subset of this state of affairs was the emergence in the 18th century of a distinctive literary category of books to be called wisdom literature. The nomenclature, wisdom, was familiar enough, but this was now to be something more formal. Publishing houses like textbooks. Wisdom literature, usually taught in semester two, was born. Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Sirach, and the wisdom of Solomon. Increasing orders of, of skepticism, decreasing tidy proverbial cause and effect schemes, bottoming out with Koheleth, and then making a rebound in the deuterocanonical books. Fortunately, at least to my mind, this model is on the wane. It might be good to have a decent introduction to the writings, which doesn't get bogged down in questions related to the different orderings in the history of reception. Wisdom, perhaps, would be better resituated in this context. And finally, biblical theology and history of interpretation. It's possible, of course, to speak about canonical interpretation as a species of modern historical critical reading, even one that was judged initially, at least in the 80s, as presenting a strong pushback by the field. In my own work, I have tried to show how canonical reading does not ignore tensions and the uneven terrain of the biblical text, but offers a different interpretation of them. The subject matter of the Bible, and precisely its life with a living people of God's choosing, has led to constant rehearing, deeper digging, fleshing out a privileged inheritance of divine disclosure as God's vital word makes its inroads through time. On this account, closure lacks the dramatic character often given to it by those who view canon as an in external imposition, the setting down of lists, proper arrangements and the like, conciliar models of approving books and closure, which never worked well at all in the Old Testament. Childs emphasized the distinctive character of Israel's sacred literature. The Old Testament is a book by and for a people 
and it comes to others in that same spirit. It is not generic literature, even as it can be treated that way and has been. The idea of attachment to a people carries over and is indebted to this same idea when it comes to Christian scripture in its two testament form. Much of my more recent writing has focused on this dimension, the Bible in its married life with the church in commentary through the ages. This also explains why Childs taught courses in the history of biblical interpretation and in 1974 included what at the time seemed an odd section on Exodus in Jewish and Christian reception in an otherwise standard critical commentary. At the time, he spoke of how the final form of the text came into sharper focus when one saw it against alleged descriptions of its coming to be, some more illuminating than others, and the same held true for its subsequent handling in church and synagogue. Crucial in the latter regard was the fact that the Bible is written from faith to faith. It anticipates readership coming to it in the same spirit as those who were its privileged bearers, prophets and apostles. The church does not conflate its position in time with earlier witnesses, but comes to scripture subject matter, God in Christ, by means of their written testimony. These things are written in the canonical form you have them that you might believe. Blessed are those who, though being neither apostle or prophet, come to the same faith by means of them. In my view, the history of interpretation exists to correct each age's overreaches and amnesias. It ought to teach a certain humility about what goes in each age for objectivity and priority. Historical critical reading is our present modern Western burden, and it should remain always provisional and preliminary and cautionary. It would be equally a mistake to hold up one special period of reading in the history of interpretation as decisive, the reformers or the second century or the Trenton period, because this robs the Bible of its special character as ruling the rule of faith and giving it its working terrain. Appropriate to our topic on the future of canonical reading, it is this dimension that seems the least plowed and furrowed by biblical scholars, with some exceptions. It was an area of special interest at Vatican II, though largely for theologians, resourcement scholars, and likely emerged for very different reasons there as a pushback against scholasticism or historical critical optimisms as they saw it. On occasion, some biblical scholars would speak of it as a fruitful area for work, Paul Beauchamp, at other times, things like typology were seized on insofar as they might be useful for tradition historical reading, von Rahn, and the linking of Old Testament and New Testament. Sensus Plenior had a day in the sun in the hands of the New Testament scholar. Boltmann wrote his thesis on Theodore of Mopsuestia, though for different reasons of possible utility. All of this has come and gone. The Bible of Alexandria Working Group in Paris brings together sharp scholars, but how this is related to biblical studies down the hall is less clear. I think this will prove true of the Blackwell's volume and also the one being edited now by Leon Xiao. I suppose this could be one of those areas where one concedes a scholar can't do everything. Yet at the same time, much of the biblical guild reflexively assumes that today's questions and answers are of some obvious higher quality. A better way to think of it is they're more complicated due to the problems of historical contextualizing and less obviously connected to a social context, the church, beyond their own limited range. Studying the history of interpretation introduces modern readers to commentary that cannot be confined to one testament or the other, or theology, or pastoral care, or homiletics, but is obliged to be of service to them all. This brings us to a final area where canonical interpretation has made a contribution, biblical theology. And again, it is a contribution without a lot of obvious models at present. John Goldingay and Walter Brueggemann have written big theologies of the Old Testament, but a signature for them both in different ways, 
is keeping such theology preserved from New Testament influence. There is a certain timeliness about this. The concern that the voice of the Old Testament in the hands of sympathetic New Testament readers leads to erasing that voice or making it something temporally en route to a subsequent testament without its own abiding Christian witness. What would a biblical theology that gives equal attention to two testaments as Christian witnesses look like? Child's own offering was daunting, over 600 pages. Was it also unwieldy? It's important to it, is it important to explain the discrete witness as against historical critical background questions, first for Old Testament, then New Testament, and then turn to familiar theological themes, God the Creator, covenant election, Christ the Lord, reconciliation, law and gospel, humanity new and old, the kingdom of God, and finally ethics. Is there a more compact model to be built on something of the same chassis? In convergences, I use the formal lectionary selections as a way to demonstrate biblical theology, especially since the Old Testament lessons which are chosen supply a wide range of models. This protects against the voice of the New Testament subsuming the voice of Israel's script witness. One might consider a biblical theology that somehow operated with this starting point, careful in so doing to cover the traditional theological themes. I know that Spiekermann and Feldmeyer are producing big volumes on Old New Testament and biblical theology, where an Old Testament person is assigned one and a new the other. I'm not sure where, the, where that model will go. It seems to me the more recent, Mark Elliott will be useful here, volumes in your book for bi biblical theology. Um, I can't see this making great head headway. The initial volumes in the first decade, I think people read, but uh, more recently, I'm not so sure. To conclude, what is the future for canonical interpretation? I tried today to briefly survey the question by looking at various developments in the field of Old Testament, in my own work, I've tried to extend a canonical approach in commentary writing in both Old and New Testament introduction, history of interpretation, technical monographs. So in range and in drilling down in technical essays, I have something of my own legacy. What will its future be? Here I look forward to reading the contributions to this volume. The field continues to prize specialization and not comprehensiveness. And I do believe canonical reading and earlier forms of biblical interpretation, by contrast, did not confine themselves to this or that silo of, re of research and writing. If canonical interpretation is defined along these wider lines, then its future, it seems to me, is not clear. At the same time, many of the concerns of canonical reading at the level of individual treatments lives on, if not explicitly calling itself that. That may be no bad thing. Bart did not encourage Bardians. If the wider concerns of canonical reading are conveyed under different rubrics, that would be enough. One final postscript. I believe the canonical approach to the New Testament, as Childs laid it out and as several generations now are looking at the question, was extremely illuminating and others have picked up that torch. We've been looking at the Old Testament today, but to the degree to which Canonical interpretation is an explicitly comprehensive affair involving New Testament, biblical theology, and reception history. It would be important to pay proper attention to the canonical reading of the New Testament and its future. And that, however, is a topic for a different day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, from our side, Professor Seitz. And I'm delighted now to introduce um, four panelists who will respond, if not to the particular things you've just said, at least to some of the broader uh, themes and arguments you laid out. Uh, I'm going to introduce them all now and not interrupt their presentations with introductions. So uh, our panelists will speak in the following order. Uh, first, uh, Professor Don Collett um, from Trinity School for Ministry, recent book on the figural reading of the Old Testament. Uh, Beth Stoville from Ambrose University. Um, she's recently co-edited a book uh, on uh, theodicy and hope in the 
12. Uh, it has uh, written a book on uh, motherhood and biblical and theological perspectives. Thirdly, um, Andrew Witt, who teaches at Tyndale uh, University College in Toronto, who has uh, written uh, especially in the realm of the Psalms. And finally, our fourth panelist, uh, Professor Mark Ginellet of Beeson Divinity School, um, who's written recently commentaries on Micah and Isaiah and a book on canonical reading itself, a topic of the conference. So uh, my welcome to all of you and we'll begin with Professor Cullen. I think you're on mute there, Don. Can you hear me now? Everybody, good. Uh, I started out by thanking Ephraim for uh, the opportunity to do this and also Chris for your work and your writings, which as you know uh, from our conversations, I've learned much from over the years. I'm going to pick up my presentation since we only have about 10 minutes to each to do this with the closing, some of the closing remarks you made, especially the uh, what I consider to be a very Catholic and charitable statement about the future of canonical interpretation, where you say that if it's conveyed under different rubrics, uh, that, that might be enough. It doesn't have to be uh, construed in a particular form that uh, I, would, I would judge, uh, you know, it would be congruent with canonical hermeneutics, but it could be under a different shape and in a different context. I think that's where I'd like to situate my response when we talk about what I'm gonna talk about, the, the future of figural reading or the idea of figure within uh, the canonical tradition. Uh, and I'll, I'll start out by uh, talking about some of the things that have happened in biblical studies that sort of work against, at least uh, as I understand figure, they work against the uh, tradition of figural reading. And then kind of talk about models of biblical theology and canon, which work with what I consider to be the affiliative logic that's at work in figure. And so that's kind of where I'm heading uh, as I try to summarize what was originally a little bit of a longer paper. Um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, the article that your Jeremias did in 2005 on, uh, he was, it was sort of a retrospect on the state of biblical studies. And he talks about five or six hypotheses, depending on how you break them down, that have sort of eroded since the time when he was a student in the 50s and 60s uh, studying what he called biblical theology and what others were calling biblical theology within the movement known as the biblical theology movement. And he says those hypotheses were as follows. The, the Yahwist as the theologian par excellence in the Solomonic Enlightenment, the uniquely apodictic character of Israel's 10 commandments, the birth of Israel from the union of 12 tribes, and the conquest understood as an outside rather than inside job, something that was performed by Israelite tribes or, or groups from outside the land of Canaan. Uh, von Rott's uh, Kleine Credo, his, the confession from which the Pentateuch grew, and then the concept of covenant as a specifically Israelite way to describe one's relationship with God. And he, for von, for uh, Jeremias, these theses were, they represented the views of what he called the theological fathers of theological exegesis and biblical theology in the 20th century. And he says, that by the time the 1970s came around, there was a total turning away from the views of the generation of these theological fathers, uh, such that they no longer seemed to apply. And he not only called attention to the fact that the great theses of the post-war period lost their general validity, but he pointed out something that I think Chris points out in, in especially in his last two books, they're really, uh, nothing has emerged as an equivalent overall view to take their place. Now, why would that be a problem? You know, it's not gonna be a problem for some people. They're gonna say, well, you know, that's a good thing <laughs> because biblical theology is understood differently. Some see it as a descriptive historical discipline 
and would sharply distinguish that from biblical theology as a constructive theological discipline. So they're not going to be bothered by the fact that uh, this constructive integrative attempt to get comprehensiveness, as Chris called it earlier, seems to be going into the background. Now, I'm uh, one who's going to argue from the tradition of canonical hermeneutics that this integrative question is still a very important one for biblical studies uh, because it seeks to explain the unifying reality that unites the two testaments in their historical discreteness. That's why concern for a rule of faith that identifies the integrating logic of the two testaments is a natural counterpart to it. Uh, but at the same time, it also recognizes the need to affirm the historical and descriptive aspects of biblical theology. So it's not leaving those behind. It's just not reducing the question to that enterprise only. It resists their separation. Integration is needed, but there are different logics of integration out there. The canonical tradition of Child's Insights offers one distinctive approach to this issue. Uh, so I want to set the discussion of figure within those broader parameters. Um, Seitz situates the rise of the canonical approach in relation to the work of both von Rott and Martin Note, but his discussion of Note's work is a more recent focus, as you'll see from the book Convergences. He focuses on Note's book, A History of the Pentateuchal Traditions. It came out in 48 in German and was translated in 72 into uh, English. Uh, I was looking at what Doug Knight had to say about this in re rediscovering Israel's traditions. He said it was a high point in the development and codification of the method of tradition history. At the time of its publication, tradition history was still something of a new method, seeking to move beyond the impasse created by Wellhausen and his followers. Uh, what was happening with source critics is documented by Seitz in his last two books. They're there's a failure to appreciate the complex formation of biblical traditions uh, and, a, and a failure to describe the affiliative moves in particular that are at work in the process of canon building. In fact, uh, these uh, earlier source criticism moves toward disaffiliation. Uh, they don't focus on the significance of the combination of Israel's sources and traditions, but they turn to the project of further refining the sources so you get sources within sources and more fragmentation. Uh, it's already hinted at in the breaking down of the Elohist source and early source criticism. And it seems like that has undergone a recent revival in the neo-documentarians. What's interesting about Note's work is he doesn't profess to be the last word on the formation history of Israel's traditions uh, or the Old Testament's final form. Here's what he says in the preface. I was especially concerned here to raise questions which must be asked and whose answers must be attempted, even though the answers may sometimes appear purely hypothetical. The concern of this work would be realized in large measure if the manner of raising the questions proved itself to be proper. I take him to be saying that the answers we, we give in our work are not as important as the questions we're trying to answer. And one of the questions note is trying to answer, what doesn't fully answer, concerns a character of historical affiliation, tradition historical affiliation, the combination of traditions in the process that produced the Old Testament's final form. We need a category or a grammar to describe that affiliative integrative process. And that seems to have fallen to Childs, building on the lead of von Rott note and many others. Uh, maybe Peter Aykroyd in Britain, uh, to invoke the language of canon to capture the dynamic of integration at work in scripture's formation history. Uh, it wasn't, as Chris points out, an appeal to closure, but about coming to terms with the character of theological pressures at work in scripture's formation history before the limits of the canon were formulated, canonization proper, that is. So to put it a different way, canon is a historically integrative pressure. I lay emphasis on historically. At work in canon building, not simply a later decision made by religious bodies about which books are in and which are out. Like biblical theology, canonical hermeneutics is a constructively integrative enterprise, and canon is the term 
that Childs invokes to describe that enterprise in its concrete historical settings. Now, a lot has been written on that. That was just to sort of frame the, the integrative logic of biblical theology and the integrative logic of canon, I think are essential for the future, obviously, of canonical interpretation. Where does figure come in? And this is my last, we're at, we're at the last part of this discussion. Figure in the future of canonical reading and the canonical approach. I think the reason figure is important or figural reading as an extension of that is because it shares in the integrative logic of biblical theology and canon. I, it builds upon the affiliative character of tradition building in the canon. Now, there are voices, of course, that regard it as fundamentally destructive of the historically dis, uh, descriptive enterprise in biblical theology. Uh, I was reading Conrad Schmidt's uh, history of uh, biblical the or a historical, uh, how, how's the title put, his uh, historical theology of the Hebrew Bible, a uh, recent book, and he quotes Jörg Feuer in this context. Jörg Feuer is describing Bart and the biblical theology movement he helped inspire in the 50s and 60s when Jeremias was studying. He says, this movement, Mrs. Feuer, did indeed address itself to the task of defining more closely the unique nature of Christianity and its God, a problem that had not been solved by religio historical theology. At the same time, though, it did Old Testament students great harm through its renunciation of any religio historical perspective, its disregard for an appropriate understanding of the uniqueness of Israelite religion, and its Here's the last part. It's revival of allegorical and typological interpretation of the Old Testament. That's uh, George Foyer's uh, History of Israelite Religion uh, cited in Conrad Schmidt. Well, I'd like to suggest that figure and figural reading uh, work with the integrative instincts that characterize the process of historical affiliation in scripture, which you can see in the work of Note and Von Rott and others. Um, there's a temporal integration that's inherent in the juxtapositional affiliative character of biblical figuralism. Or you could put it differently, there's a, the gravitational pull of biblical figures gathers together significant persons, places, and events from disparate contexts of the future and the past. It bridges their temporal gaps by treating them as features of one and the self-same theological reality. And I would say in that sense, figure or figural exegesis condenses and epitomizes the affiliative logic of the tradition building process in canon formation. What's interesting though, and I think this sets it apart from more recent narrative and story-shaped approaches to uh, uh, canonical reading, it does it in a way that orders time and it orders time in a way that is subversive of linear and chronological models. There's a folding of time inherent in biblical figuralism in which different epics are made to touch and resonate with one another. I ran across that in Mike Floyd's, uh, a recent piece by Mike Floyd's discussion of this issue. And that's why figure can negotiate the starts, stops, temporal gaps, and rut ruptures in what Sites calls in Elder Testament, the strange old book we know as the new, the Old Testament. When it comes to ordering time via biblical narrative and sequence building, its logic of integration is not linear, but juxtapositional. And I think that's important because uh, it seems like the seamless transitions you find in the way story and narrative are typically constructed, often in the service of the revival of theological interpretation and patristic hermeneutics, they don't get at this dimension. One could argue that's because they have no strong investment or interest in the character of canon's formation history or what Chris calls its coming to be, its deepened dimension or depth dimension in the German tradition. So certain models are gonna be less interested in how to think theologically about the kind of integrative logic needed to negotiate the significance of the historical and temporal unevenness, the ruptures of scripture. I'm not sure narrative and story are that well suited to do that, but I think the canonical tradition is well suited to do that. 
and figure as sort of an epitome of that affiliative logic, uh, it makes good sense that it will have a future in canonical interpretation. I close now with reminding you of Child's last essay, one of his last essays uh, on allegory and typology in biblical interpretation. Uh, in that essay, he, he seems to be moving in the direction of realizing that his concept of canon as an integrative uh, integer, so to speak, for describing the affiliative moves in tradition building in, the, in scripture, uh, the way to connect that with the long history of interpretation is to recover some kind of usable concept of allegory and typology. He has other concerns in there, but uh, that's, that's one of the ones that he's working on in that essay. So all of which is to say, I don't think figure is a non-historical mode of reading. It's a deeply historical mode of reading, but it's a particular kind of history that works that figure is working with that's rooted in the affiliative logic of the canon's formation and tradition building. And for that reason, uh, it, it will maybe perhaps remain in theological interpretation and in, in the revival of patristic exegesis, but its, its relationship will at best be, at least on my view, ambiguous. So that's it, I'm, I'm closing now. That's my uh, presentation, I'll be interested to hear what Professor Seitz thinks about that or anybody else. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Don. Um, and I'd like to express my thanks to Ephraim for the invitation, uh, as well as to Chris Seitz for his thoughtful paper as a starting point for our conversations. Um, my responses will engage Dr. Seitz's work by focusing specifically on his discussion of prophetic literature and canonical interpretation and his discussion of canonical interpretation as pointing to the Bible as written from faith to faith and his statement that these things are written and in the canonical form you have them that you might believe. Um, in line with this, I hope to explore a specific question that canonical interpretation raises. How effective is canonical interpretation for dealing with the specific difficult texts and the issues that these difficult biblical texts raise in our church context. And I will specifically look at the complex text of Ezekiel 16 and explore how canonical interpretation of the text has the potential for confronting issues of violence against women in our churches. For this panel response, um, I locate myself in really two vocational roles that I am I regularly have. Um, I'm a professor of Old Testament, as uh, Ephraim mentioned, um, where I teach at Ambrose Seminary, training students for pastoral ministry and for other kinds of ministry in church contexts. And I also work with my husband, John Stovell, uh, to oversee theological and spiritual formation at a national level for my denomination, Vineyard Canada. And from these two context, uh, these inform the questions that I ask of biblical hermeneutics. I often ask not only how effective is a particular, a particular hermeneutical approach for understanding the biblical text, but also how does this hermeneutical approach help us engage specific questions that arise from the text that impact our churches today? Um, as I argued alongside Stan Porter in our conclusion to Biblical Hermeneutics Five Views, when we come to the biblical text, we come seeking a historical reality of the event and the person, what's behind the text. We seek the meaning of this story, what's within the text, and we come seeking the transformative power of this text in the lives of those who believe what is in front of the text. So I plan to highlight uh, some of the recent canonical interpretations of Ezekiel or kind of sort of ish canonical, well, I'll, I'll clarify that, um, that inform our discussion. I'll locate Ezekiel 16 as a troubling text, and then I'll talk about how canonical interpretation gives us opportunities to engage Ezekiel 16 in our churches in meaningful ways, in a sense as a test case for the future of Old Testament canonical interpretation. So first, uh, the background of canonical interpretation of Ezekiel. As Dr. Seitz has noted, studies in Ezekiel have not followed the canonical interpretation perspective as extensively as we see in other fields. Some scholars have gone as far as to speak against canonical approaches in Ezekiel studies uh, for fear of multiple things that they mention, uh, while others try to avoid the language of canonical and use phrases more like holistic. Uh, and you see this in works such as Zimmerle and Greenberg. Uh, while many scholars at the same time see Ezekiel as predominantly a unified text, and many see this text even dating back largely to the prophet Ezekiel. Um, 
a smaller number are willing to use the language of canonical interpretation to speak of their approaches. Yet meanwhile, scholars are using interdisciplinary approaches that seem to engage with uh, Robert Childs and his way of thinking while moving this alongside other disciplines such as post-colonial theory, trauma theory, and psychological study to explore new avenues in Ezekiel. For example, in his book, Biblical Theology of Exile, Daniel Smith Christopher builds indirectly on Child's approach to explore how reading Ezekiel as a whole gives us a picture of a prophet who has been through extensive trauma and how this trauma shapes the vividness of the violence in his writing. While Smith Christopher would probably not point to Child's as his source, he would point more directly to post-colonial theory and trauma theory. Um, his reading as a whole Ezekiel, reading Ezekiel in this, in this holistic way uh, tends to actually fall within some of the broader themes of canonical approaches, and particularly the biblical theological side of what we heard Dr. Seitz discussing. So why is Ezekiel 16 such a troubling text? Scholars have described the language of Ezekiel 16 uh, as gruesome, disturbing. Some feminist scholars have gone as far as to use the word pornographic of this text. Uh, this is because descriptions of sexuality and violence in Ezekiel 16 are so graphic that modern interpreters need to use English euphemisms to encourage readers not to avoid the passage entirely. Even the euphemisms, uh, even with these euphemisms in place, Ezekiel 16 is still a difficult text. Ezekiel 16 tells the story of God's wife, Jerusalem, who's found discarded as a baby. He cleans her, washes her, watches her grow up. He marries her only to find her whoring. Um, herself among the nations. And God's judgment on Jerusalem is depicted in a few gruesome ways. So first of all, all of her past lovers surround her. They violently attack her in ways that may include sexual violence, expose her naked body, and they eventually stone her and cut her into pieces, similar to the concubine in Judges 19, who is raped by a mob until she dies and is cut up into pieces. Only after this violence is done against Jerusalem is God's anger sated. The troubling nature of this text is, I would assume, obvious to everyone listening, especially if one pictures the body of a literal woman experiencing this horrific fate. The text is even more troubling because the punishment is overseen and endorsed by God himself. So what do we do with a troubling passage like this one, and how does a canonical interpretation help us deal with its complexity? One of the problems with reading Ezekiel 16 has to do with its placement in the book of Ezekiel. Should Ezekiel 16 be read with the preceding pictures of doom and judgment in Ezekiel 12 to 15? Should it be read with the parables and allegories and complex imagery of Ezekiel 17 to 24 that come after it? And in that section, we see Ezekiel 23, which presents a story of two sisters that again, prostitute themselves and are explicitly named Jerusalem and Samaria, which echoes Ezekiel 16. Here is where reading Ezekiel 16 canonically becomes valuable. By reading Ezekiel 16 um, as a unit within a larger unified text, we can see it as a hinge point between two sections. One can see Ezekiel 16 impact, impacted by the audience framing of Ezekiel 14.1 as elders come to listen to Ezekiel. The audience of Ezekiel 16 is key because it turns the entire depiction of violence on its head and explains the gruesome depiction of violence in this text. If the audience of Ezekiel 14.1 remains in Ezekiel 16, the passage is not endorsing violence against women, but using the horrific victimization of women against Israel's elite leaders, the very, man, the very men who once had power and used it for the oppression of others, the men who formed alliances with foreign nations and victimized their own people. These men who once held so much power are asked to picture themselves as the female victim who is powerless against the violence done to her. This is the judgment against their own violence. Not only does reading the biblical passage in this way help us realign with the violence done against Jerusalem means as a way of leveling um, those who grasp for power, dominance, and used it for oppression, it also fits the broader picture of Jerusalem as bride in other parts of Ezekiel and other prophetic books in light of a canonical reading of the text. As Dr. Seitz has shown us, child's approach and canonical interpretation more broadly gives us an avenue to engage the questions of Ezekiel 16 in this broader canonical context, not only in terms of reading Ezekiel 16 in the final form of the book of Ezekiel, but also reading Ezekiel 16 in light of its location as a prophetic book in the Old Testament and as a valued book in the New Testament. In doing so, Ezekiel Ezekiel 16 can be read along, alongside Hosea, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, 
And for Christians, this can also include reading in light of how this text sits in the New Testament. The broader canonical context of Ezekiel helps us uh, better read the specific text in light of a variety of biblical texts that use this imagery of God as husband and Israel as wife. It helps us identify the times where biblical prophets railed against the oppression and violence of Israel's leaders, where prophets gave warning upon warning about their oppression and idolatrous ways, predicting the ultimate outcome. If Israel's leaders, their male elite, offered themselves to the nations, prostituted themselves to gain a security apart from God, these choices would have ultimate con consequences that led not only to the Assyrian invasion, but also to the Babylonian exile. Ezekiel in, within the book has personally witnessed these consequences where he sits in exile. We see him mourning the loss of his once great city with visions of violence of Jerusalem's siege, invading his thoughts and dreams and flowing out into his prophecies. So what does this approach to Ezekiel 16, how does it impact what happens in our churches today? First, we acknowledge that reading Ezekiel 16 is not a neutral process. How we come to the text of Ezekiel 16 will impact what we see in the text, whether we accept it, reject it, accept it with certain reservations, or what struggles we have with this text. Second, as we examine the world in front of this text, we need to acknowledge the forms of violence, including sexual violence that happen against women in this country of Canada. The statistics, the statistics of domestic violence and sex trafficking in our country are bleak. Sex trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry that is more lucrative than drugs or guns. Covenant House Toronto, Canada's largest agency serving youth who are homeless, trafficked, and at risk, provides statistics on the numbers of women and girls and boys who are trafficked each year. The average age of these victims is 17, but they can be as young as 13, and we have examples of Indigenous girls as young as eight who have been trafficked for sex in Canada. In February 2020, a CTV article demonstrated the prevalence of sex trafficking that is still happening in Canada, while another study showed that Canadians are unaware of the warning signs of sex trafficking. This study showed that the majority of Canadians think that human trafficking starts with abductions off the street, and most Canadians think of people who are not like themselves experiencing these abductions. But in reality, most victims of sex trafficking are brought in by a boyfriend or a friend without realizing what's happening. This tells us not only is the kind of sexual violence against women more common than we think, but we as Canadians are less aware of when it's happening and to whom it's happening than we actually think we are. The report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls showed us how Indigenous women and girls have experienced violence and have been overlooked by our policing systems. The numbers in this report are staggering. In 2018, I volunteered for Walking With Our Sisters. This organization honored these missing and murdered women and girls with rooms full of moccasins associated with each woman and girl. As I walked through the space, I realized that these women and girls impacted their entire communities and how few in Canada realized the depth of the loss on so many people. So what can we do to respond to this and how does a canonical reading of Ezekiel 16 help us? Because we are often afraid to speak of sexuality and violence in our churches in a similar way to our euphemistic, our euphemistic translations of Ezekiel, we miss the opportunity to talk uh, to our churches about what's happening around us. We miss the opportunity to speak the names of women who have been raped and murdered. We miss the opportunity to minister to women and men in our congregations who've experienced violence, trauma, or sexual assault. In doing so, we may avoid the very places where people need the deepest healing and the places where our world needs our involvement to see change. With all of its complexity, is reading Ezekiel 16 in a broader canonical context gives us the opportunity to open up discussions about violence in our churches. In this way, we respond to Ezekiel 13.10's stark call to leaders, do not say peace when there is no peace. Ezekiel 16 in the context of Ezekiel 13 forces us to face down our own tendencies to pretend there is peace where there is no peace. To pretend that all around us is fine when violence, injustice, and trauma persist. Reading Ezekiel 16 canonically provides us a way to approach these issues head on, acknowledging that scripture itself addresses these taboo and difficult subjects. In doing so, we not only honor the lives of men and of women who have experienced this violence, we open the opportunity to heal the lives of individuals, communities, and to work towards change in our country. I see this as the future of Old Testament canonical interpretation. 
When used properly, it can have the power to explore complex texts in ways that transform us and the world around us. Thank you for listening. All right, I think I'm working here. Okay, thank you Ephraim and uh, to Wycliffe College for the invitation to participate in this event. It's a distinct privilege to be able to celebrate the achievements of my esteemed professor, Christopher Seitz, in this way. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, as a newly minted assistant professor in biblical studies, I kind of feel a little bit like Elihu in the book of Job, uh, desiring to impress everybody with keen words of insight but ultimately not adding much to the larger conversation that has not already been said uh, or will be trumped by greater words to come. Nevertheless, uh, over the past decade, I have made a concerted effort uh, in the book of the Psalms, uh, publishing a few articles and also in the final proofing stages of my monograph on the figure of David in Psalms 3 through 14, uh, which is a version of the dissertation over which Professor Seitz advised. Uh, so my comments today are going to be centered on the future of canonical interpretation in the Old Testament, but specifically within the book of Psalms, which is where I am most familiar. Reading an earlier draft of uh, Professor Seitz's presentation, uh, the distinct impression I had gotten is that the Old Testament canonical interpretation is in a time of transition in some ways, with newer generations of scholars approaching the topic in not quite the same way as Childs had approached it, nor even Seitz himself. As a way to illustrate this, I entered the field via evangelical circles uh, through the work of the late John Salehammer and through Robert Cole in the Psalms, uh, both of whom were at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, at the time. And they preferred the term compositional approach rather than canonical, emphasizing a more synchronic and structuralist method combined with an unabashed messianic reading of the text. And uh, ironically, the advice I had gotten at the time uh, was to be careful in reading Brevard Childs. Uh, there was a certain suspicion uh, of the diachronic elements in his canonical approach, uh, but I distinctly remember uh, buying uh, both the introduction to the Old Testament of scripture and uh, Old Testament theology in a canonical context and uh, when I read them for the first time, it was almost like a breath of fresh air for me and uh, a warm academic hug, if I can put that in those terms. Um, I found Brevard Childs's breadth of knowledge humbling, uh, but also that he cared deeply about the relationship between scripture and the church. Uh, for him, the Bible uh, as scripture is authoritative for the church. And that was something I think at the time I was not anticipating when uh, encountering his work. Uh, my years under Professor Seitz have helped solidify my interest in this approach, and I've appreciated his own careful attention to how the Old and New Testament work together in their own discrete ways as a witness to Christ. So enough of my own history, let's uh, look a bit at a uh, canonical approach in the Psalms. Um, of course, uh, the canonical approach uh, in the Psalms begins with the work of uh, Brevard Childs in the 1970s, as he perceived a diminishing of returns in the use of form criticism and cult criticism that dominated the 20th century. Uh, his basic argument was that these methods were atomistic in their focus on individual Psalms at the detriment of recognizing the importance of the final form of the book. And in this respect, he laid the groundwork for a, for a fuller appreciation of its achievement. In his work, he emphasized a number of structural aspects of the book, building off observations of those who went before him. Uh, but he also sought out new ground by setting a methodological framework by which we could appreciate the transformation of Psalms from their use within the cultic life of ancient Israel to their new context within sacred scripture. Here, he noted royal and wisdom themes at key junctures of the book, as well as the historical editorial inscriptions connecting the Psalter to the life of David. Now, within this new approach to the book of Psalms, several of his students took up the task of filling out the details 
more program programmatically. Uh, two students in particular have stood out from the rest, uh, I think, in my opinion. Uh, Gerald Wilson, in his monograph, The Editing of the Hebrew Psalter, uh, has proven to be a benchmark in the field. He focused much attention on methodological questions associated with a canonical approach, as well as the critical questions related to the structure of the book in its ancient setting. This was followed by a sensitive reading of the Psalter in theological terms, uh, but it was made in charitable disagreement with how Childs himself had construed the overall editorial agenda of the collection. Uh, another student of Childs, uh, Gerald Wilson, uh, on the other hand, uh, in his published works was more concerned with this concept of what he called semantic transformation, uh, which is another aspect of uh, something Childs had uh, emphasized. Uh, and so what this is, is uh, it's how is the meaning of a psalm changed from its historical context within the cultic life of ancient Israel to its present context within sacred scripture. And so one way to ask this question is, in what ways has this new environment transformed the individual psalm as, is, as it is now part of an enduring word for all generations? The past 40 years uh, have spent much ink on the canonical study of the psalms. Uh, just look at any bibliography, it's ginormous. <laughs> Uh, and from the consistent publications in this field, it doesn't look like the topic is really letting up. And so this gives me hope personally and perhaps selfishly uh, as I plan on continuing to publish in this area. Uh, so where does the future of canonical study of the Psalms lie? Uh, one of the areas I think that, that's, that Seitz has emphasized quite a, a bit is this intersection between the history of interpretation and the canonical approach. Uh, I think this is something that uh, the future, uh, th there's a, a lot of promise for this in the future. Uh, Gerald Wilson's own work while paving the way for canonical studies, uh, he wasn't really concerned with this issue at all. Uh, he was mostly concerned with the shaping of the Psalter in its final form and the editorial agenda of the book. Uh, if you pick up his commentary in the NIVAC series, uh, you'll find him doing mostly form critical work and uh, undertaking just typical analysis of the speaker in the Psalms. And, uh, and he's really not saying much canonically about each Psalm uh, individually. And so, uh, and so you can see this kind of endeavor is a little bit different than what he undertook. Um, but Shepard's focus on semantic transformation, I think is greatly supplemented by the history of interpretation uh, especially as we look into how commentators and preachers uh, throughout church history have heard these psalms within their own so social context. Uh, and, and so this gets back to this language in Childs about the pressure of the text on its readers, right? If the canonical text is exerting some kind of pressure, then we should be able to recognize some important consistencies in how the church has heard the text throughout the ages, uh, as well as different themes and observations which might observe due to their own context and history. And it's, and it's in those areas, I think in particular, that they might be observing features of the text that are part of our own blind spots that we have in our modern context. And so, uh, so I'm delighted to see that there's been so many uh, translations of these older commentaries into English. Um, I know us newer scholars, we, our Greek and our Latin are not up to task usually. Uh, and so it's harder to get a hold of these materials um, but there's been a lot of new publications recently uh, and more on the way uh, through the grapevine that I've heard of from Eusebius, Hilary of Poitiers, uh, the recent origin homilies that have been uh, discovered. Uh, there's translations on Aquinas that are happening and so on and so on. So there's a lot of uh, things opening up that I think will help us uh, in the future in that respect. Uh, other areas that I think uh, in Psalm studies that are important, uh, this intersection between dialogical analysis and uh, the canonical approach. Uh, and so here we're looking at just the, the different voicing op uh, options that are available uh, for hearing this text. And, um, and so as kind of uh, diverse voicing and interpretive communities have become part of the larger uh, biblical studies, um, I do think it's time for Psalm scholarship to begin to think about uh, who might be speaking in the Psalms in different ways. Right, so looking at the role of the speaker, uh, 
uh, the role of who is the speaker addressing, whether that's the Lord or different uh, human uh, beings in their community, um, and even the role of bystanders and the role that they play uh, in listening in. And this is something that Gerald Shepard focused a lot on in, in the things that he wrote. But where do we fit in on the margins of this conversation, right? Are we, uh, are we people that are going to be like Eli, uh, blessing the prayers of women like Hannah, um, or maybe we're more like Abishai, who hears the cursing of Shammai and wants to cut his head off, right? So, uh, so there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, listen in to the prayers uh, of the people who are uh, saying these kind of psalms. Um, and there's also been renewed interest in this thing called prosopological exegesis in recent years um, through the work of people like Matthew Bates. Um, and so how do we square this in with the canonical approach in the history of interpretation? Um, that's a bigger question uh, that we have to have, I think, and especially looking at how does the canonical book of Psalms set up the speaker for us? So is there anything that the Psalms are doing you know, within the book itself that are trying to push the reader into certain ways of hearing the text? And so, um, so I know I'm doing some work in there. So uh, I see the future there, obviously a bit selfishly, but uh, I do think that uh, that's something that we're going to have to uh, to look at more. And then lastly, uh, the other area is kind of further developments uh, within intertextuality and interbiblical interpretation. And so some of this has to do with the biographical titles in the Psalms and seeing how they relate to uh, David within the book of Samuel or in the book of Chronicles. Uh, but then also, how about some of the other figures that are mentioned in these titles as well? Um, how do we understand them in relation to what these texts are saying? So people like Solomon, Moses, Asaph, the sons of Korah. Um, the history of interpretation, I think, has a lot to offer there um, for those with the patience to, uh, to dig into them. Um, and then uh, one final part of that has to do with the juxtaposition of the Psalter with uh, other books in the writings. And so looking at specifically kind of narrowing that focus in on uh, Job and on Proverbs, right? These three books um, have been affiliated uh, all throughout history, no matter kind of what uh, ordering of the canon that we have. Um, and they've always been kind of kept together. And so, uh, so some research into this uh, has been already undertaken by Will Kynes uh, down at Beeson. And, um, and so he has a lot we can read on this already. Um, but even just some imaginative work, maybe with some of the different canon orders, uh, which put Ruth right before the book of Psalms, right? And usually this is just talking about as a chronological move, since it's providing us with some kind of background to David's life. Um, but could there be some more um, theological reasons for some of that ordering that could be there too? So there's some work there that I think could be uh, interesting in the future. Um, so just to conclude, uh, all these things, uh, all these different areas, I think are profoundly interesting, uh, in part because I'm working in the Psalter in this way, uh, but also because of how important the book of Psalms is, not only within the canon of scripture, right, the most quoted book in the New Testament, uh, but also within the life of both the church and the synagogue. And so I'm looking forward to how, uh, you know, the current generation of scholars and us new guys are going to be researching into these different areas. And I think in the end, it will only help to strengthen the church. Thanks. Okay, am I on? Okay, good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak today on the topic of the future of the canonical approach in the seminary classroom. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to offer this response to Professor Sykes's presentation and really have looked forward to our gathering today for some time. Our topic of the future of the canonical approach is a fertile one and could go in multiple directions. I believe Professor Sykes is right to speak of the diffuse character of the canonical approach's positive future. The language of the final form of the text, for example, still generates some vexation among critics. Whose final form are we talking about? It's often the presenting critical question. Nevertheless, voices from across the theological disciplines appeal to this central tenet of the canonical approach as a clarification of their own vis-a-vis -vis with historical criticism and its tendency to prioritize a text prehistory, or perhaps more positively, in their reticence to read Holy Scripture first and foremost as a problematized text. Uh, just a few examples here. Uh, Catherine Sonderegger's 
a first volume of her systematic theology includes the canonical approach as a sustained interlocutor in her readings of Numbers and Genesis. At one point, she even exclaims, all hail the canonical school, even though in her evaluation, the canonical school sells itself theologically short if it remains on the literary level alone. The biblical text is instrumental to, the, to encounter with its living subject matter. The earthen vessel of scripture for Sonderegger brings us into the fiery presence of the living Lord. That's, that's her language. Ellen Davis is another example, herself a student of Childs, uh, leaves us with the legacy of her classroom teaching in Opening Israel Scripture, her, her new book. Davis, like Childs, has no allergy to diachronic realities. She recognizes that most books of the Old Testament were, in her words, composed and shaped by with multiple writers and editors, end quote. Nevertheless, the focus of her introductory work, a work with students in mind, it should be noted, is on reading each biblical book as a literary whole. Though biblical books contain no single point of view in terms of single authorial agent, she says each book in evinces a high degree of polyphonic coherence. Synagogue and church are recipients of this polyphonic coherence in the book's final literary form. Jonathan Burnside's God, Justice, and Society is an ambitious attempt, another example, uh, to think through the societal and judicial implications of Torah's wide-angled lens, all for the sake of modern lawyers and students of the law. Burnside's work is a decade old now and remains of some consequence, I think. My pedestrian observation of his work has to do with Burnside's appeal to the Bible as text in its final form. He clarifies his approach as a teacher, saying, my own experience of teaching the subject in a law school has shown me that the task of familiarizing students with the biblical materials is made overly complex by introducing them at the same time to a wide range of hypothetical reconstructions regarding the provenance and composition of the biblical text. As a result, he says, this book adopts a canonical or final form approach to the biblical texts. Burnside draws a parallel between a canonical reading and doctrinal law as it pertains to the traditional lawyer's handling of legal sources. Both the canonical approach and doctrinal law, he says, work with the finished product and seek to make sense of it as a body of normative literature. I, I mentioned these few sources because they all draw from the categories of the canonical approach and their varied theological, interpretive, and ethical endeavors with the language of the text's final form, clearing the interpretive deck so that the object of interpretation becomes clear. With two of them especially, Davis and Burnside, the concern of the teacher becomes apparent. I want to home in on this particular concern because I have an affinity with Davis's and Burnside's focus on teaching and wish to speak about the canonical's approach, a canonical approach's future in the classroom. And more particular to my own context, the seminary classroom of a North American evangelical institution. Much like the future of Karl Barth studies in North America, I believe the canonical approach finds a happy home and a bright future in the seminary classroom, and perhaps more definitively, the classroom in context where scripture's primacy and authority are still confessed. I realize not everyone participating in this virtual event shares the same location in their academic and researching lives, so I recognize the limitations. At the same time, many folks participating in today's event do operate in this sphere or something akin to it. In my context here at Beeson and Divinity School in the heart of the Bible Belt, I should say, in Birmingham, Alabama, I have two kinds of students that enter into my classroom, and both are the beneficiaries of the canonical approaches interpretive instincts. The first kind of student is quick to dismiss diachronic concerns. The Bible isn't a problematized text for them, and the atomistic instincts of the critical tradition remains a foreign language to them. Still, the canonical approach offers an important corrective to the historicist legacy of the evangelical hermeneutical tradition of the, say, Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart type, of reading the Bible for all it's worth, a type, I might say, that still dominates so much of the landscape. I marvel to look back almost 20 years now at my time in the seminar rooms of St. Andrews as we discuss the legacy of what Chris would refer to as overly historicist approaches to hermeneutics or his identifying the legacy of N.T. Wright's work as a species of historicist apologetics. I remember thinking back then that my interpretive universe was opening up before me and a clear path was being laid out to liberate the evangelical world from its historicist shackles. Surely the old patterns and assumptions will give way. 
only to be 20 years down the road with so many of the same issues before us, especially in the broad halls of the North American evangelical world. The canonical approach offers a corrective, or, or perhaps better, a redirective to the biblical text itself in conjunction with its theological subject matter as the privileged location for our pastoral, homiletical, and our theological work, something Chris mentions in his paper as the biblical theological direction the canonical approach took um, from Childs and Sites himself. My experience with students here is this canonical as biblical theological world continues to offer them the fresh air I experienced so long ago in Sites' seminar room. I, I, as an aside, I, I found some of the essays in Garrett Green's a newish book, Imagining Theology, to be interesting reading, especially his chapter on Hans Frey and the Second Naivete. They're leaving to the side the long-term value of a term like the Second Naivete. His personal epilogue at the end of this chapter was really moving. And Green speaks of reading the Bible with prisoners who are not experiencing a Second Naivete in their reading of Scripture, but still operate in a pre-critical First Naivete, we might say. For Green, he says the Bible means what it says, so we can read scripture, the learned, second naivete, and the unlearned, first naivete, in order to hear God's word together. And then Green says something I found so fascinating. He says, I've become more tolerant of fundamentalists. I've finally outgrown the fundamentalist bashing that I learned growing up in mainline churches and heard throughout my career in academia. I too, for what it's worth, share Green's sentiments and find a deep point of contact with my students who remain within something like the first naivete. But that's not the only kind of student I have. There's another kind of student reared in a confessional home of some sort or another, free church or Protestant denominations most often, who arrive at college to have their world turned upside down by critical theories delivered to them in ways that appear at best unpastoral or at worst hostile to the Christian faith. I encounter this student quite a bit and often meet them at the crossroads of their confusion how does one faithfully engage the critical material and its diachronic legacy? I just received an email from one such student this semester. She's a bright and thoughtful young woman. I asked her if I could share a part of her email. Uh, and, she, and she recounts her undergraduate courses in biblical studies and the way they left her in her language torn and confused about scripture's reliability. And then after her exposure in divinity school to the canonical approach, she offered the following. I'm so encouraged to see an approach, she says, to Christian scholarship that can unashamedly receive scripture as the trustworthy word of God, even if Isaiah didn't write all of the books of Isaiah or other questions we don't know the answers to. I know this is not groundbreaking she, discovery, she says, for many who have been studying much longer than I have, but I'm deeply grateful nonetheless. The canonical approach offers and provides for these second types of students an appreciative and critical understanding of scripture's depth dimension within the frame of God's providential oversight of creaturely affairs and leaves them with a whole Bible and a clear object of interpretation for the sake of encountering again what Sunderegger calls the fiery presence of a living God. I do believe um, a doubling down on our efforts as teachers of scripture is important and vital in our moment, especially when our students are sorting through a host of challenging cultural and political dynamics. Much like C.S. Lewis's famed essay, Learning in Wartime, we too are in a cultural and societal moment of some consequence, or so it appears. One of my colleagues who heads up the Western Intellectual Tradition or Great Books Program here at Sanford University believes we may be seeing the unraveling of our republic. I mean, while that might sound alarmist prima facie, the cultural shifts are hard to miss and our students can be easily distracted with so many challenging issues to sort through. So with Lewis, there can be some anxiety about the simple tasks of teaching students to read scripture closely and well in conversation with the tradition and for the sake of the church when it appears that Rome is burning outside. Of course, Lewis was speaking of the Second World War and its particular challenges to what we might call normal life in the university. Lewis's moment brought an acute sense of human mortality to the public consciousness and, his, and in his own wry way, Lewis said, what does war do to death? It certainly does not make it more frequent. 100% of us die and the percentage cannot be increased. But with the Christians of the past, Lewis thought it good for us to be aware of our mortality. It focuses our sense of being and purpose. It guards us against allowing our excitements to move too quickly to the zeitgeist, either in defense or criticism of it. 
keeping us focused on the tasks of attending to scripture for the sake of Christ church and the world. The future of the canonical approach within the academic guild will prove itself in time, even if its deployment will be diffuse. And its future in the classroom, preparing men and women for parish ministry, for, to my mind, remains remarkably bright. Far from a determinative methodology assur assuring certain exegetical outcomes, the canonical appro approach provides a clarifying set of interpretive instincts and a clear object of interpretation for the sake of encountering scripture's subject matter. I see a mirror of my own life-giving encounter with the canonical approach reflected in my students' faces year after year. Lewis thought an awareness of mortality helped us to frame our frustration at the limits of our work and our abilities. No one, he said, has time to finish and we leave futurity in God's hands. So too with the canonical approach in all of our work, especially with our students, we leave its futurity in God's hands. Thank you. Right, I think it's me now. Um, to when do try... I respond, just out of curiosity? Sorry? When do I respond to the papers? Uh, I think you're gonna have to respond, Chris, in the context of people asking a couple of questions. Is that okay? Um, yeah. Otherwise, we're not gonna have any time for any Q&A at all. Um, but I think if you could feed that in, that would be great, you know, when the response to the questions. Now, just to those of you out there, I hope everyone can hear me. I have really two questions at the moment typed up in the Q&A box. If anybody else wants to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box within the next minute or two. I will start with a question that I have here, which in some sense, I think other people have already kind of started to answer, but I think it might be a question of how can we do more of this or what can we, what kind of things we'd be doing more of to, to, to improve our our ability to integrate, this is the question, how do we integrate or how do we cultivate students to integrate biblical studies, biblical theology, reception history and doctrine in a constructive fashion? Does anyone get any tips? I don't think the person, the, the question is asking for a kind of meta theory, but what kind of things that could be, have we just been thinking of, we could, we could be doing a little bit better on that front to have a whole kind of team approach to getting um, this, what canonical, approach stands for across the sort of theological faculty. You Chris, know, why don't you go first, Jim? Yeah, I mean, it seems to me, Mark, that um, the reason that, that reading the history of interpretation is interesting is, and I alluded to it, particularly the Old Testament, is that invariably uh, Christian interpretation of the Old Testament has to will 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 need to deal with the relationship between the Testaments, New Testament interpretation of the Old, pastoral care, ethics, church. I mean, it, so in a way, if you're trying to find a place to try to taste an integrative uh, model, that's pretty good, and it's it, you're reading texts. You're not just you know, saying, well, here, I did my theology, I did my biblical studies, I'm gonna to try to figure out how to bring them together. You sit and you read, as you and I have done when we taught those seminars in St. Andrews, the point was that we could get historians, theologians, pastoral care folks, New Testament, Old Testament people all in the same classroom because we were reading a common text and the interpreters of those texts were asking, were dealing with those different things and they weren't different silos they were all they were all together so practically speaking i think that's a pretty good way to go go read luther on the psalms read augustine on the psalms whatever um yeah great i, mean, I should say that wasn't my that wasn't my question that was a question from chris ansbury so thanks chris um i have another question from adam shabata i think his name is and um I think Andy, perhaps if you could be picking up on this as well as, as, as Chris here or, or any, any other of the panelists. And his question, I think reading it between the lines is about the kind of things that are going on in the wisdom literature at the moment. So in wisdom literature, there is this kind of move by people like Will Kinds that we know, Catherine Dell. Um, and this person is saying, what, could, what has a canonical approach got to offer some of these uh, new uh, avenues in, in, in wisdom literature interpretation? Is it just gonna say amen to what's going on there or does it have something else to say? Um, Chris and Andy, perhaps to, to start with. 
Rwandi. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, just the broader question of the wisdom literature is um, you're kind of divorcing. I mean, the trend has been to divorce this from the Solomonic character that it's portrayed with within scripture itself, right? So, uh, so scripture has, um, you know, it's, it's united, um, you know, a lot of these, the so-called wisdom books with Solomon. And, uh, and I think, in, in at least what I've read, a lot of that's just been dismissed within the academic conversation about the wisdom literature, because obviously Solomon didn't write these things. And so that, that's kind of severing the connection there in much the same way that David is severed from the Psalms if they have been written after him. And so I think something that the canonical approach could bring is to try to tease out this relationship, like what kind of theological kind of a groundwork is being laid by associating this with Solomon. Um, and, and so, I mean, yeah, there's, I, I haven't done as much reading in the wisdom literature myself, or I'm even still saying wisdom literature, right? But in this kind of wisdom work, but I think tracing that element out, uh, connecting to Solomon, but then also uh, maybe seeing uh, just how much wisdom themes having, have been become part of scripture as a whole, whether that's in Deuteronomy, uh, into the prophets, uh, into the Psalms, and just seeing um, that it's not just limited to these uh, individual books, but there's you know, it's spread out throughout the canon. Yeah, I think um, it, it, in respect of my own comments on this, Adam, um, what I was really focusing on was this idea that there's a textbook kind of uh, containable version of how one talks about wisdom that moves from Proverbs to uh, Job, and then negotiates the inner workings of Job, Elihu, sort of rescue effort on the divine speeches. And then you move to Koheleth, it gets very despairing. That model of sort of increasing pessimism popularized by um, uh, Crenshaw uh, laid heavy on the field. And at present, there are very few people, I think, that believe that, that that's, a, that's a good model forward. Um, sorry, Crenshaw, but uh, the people working in wisdom uh, are less and less. I, who was it? Craig Bartholomew, I think, said that thing is done. You know, I mean, basically, that's it's done. We, we've done that. It's over. And Craig's a mild-mannered guy. Um, my question then will be, well, what do we do as a, another way of getting into that locus, of that, that important set of books and themes in the Old Testament? I think the writings are one way to do it, um, but enough. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Chris, um, I want to make, bring in a question for, for Don Collett, I think might have a, something to say about, I mean, and yourself, and that's the question of the, the old kind of opposition almost, as it were, between history and theology in the works of some of the German scholarship, even like Conrad Schmidt today, um, who wants to sort of talk about what was the kind of theological ideas that somebody in 540 had that some that somebody in 5, 4, 530 didn't have you know that kind of thing um because that's really what matters it's um you get that something like in, in Bruce McCormack's way of also looking at you know the development of Karl Barth's theology you know it's kind of very important to know what was thought at the time almost more important than actually what the ideas are and I heard Don sort of talk about Martin Note sort of in a rather kind of um, I was going to say, can you talk in a misty-eyed or a dew-eyed way you can't know, but talking in a, in a honeyed way about Martin Note as somebody who synthesized rather than kind of analyzed or broke down. Don, could you say something a little bit more about, about that? You there, Don? Oh, yeah, I'm on. Am I on now? You can hear me. Um, I was trying to uh, do justice to the fact that, uh, well, someone like Note, or I would even say in the canonical tradition of Trials and Sights, historical discreteness is respected. It's not, um, it's not something that is, you know, written or that we ride roughshod over in the attempt to unify scripture. Um, perhaps from the figural point of view, which is what I was talking from, it, the reason I think figuration can 
uh, maintain that concern with not overriding discrete historical contexts is because the unifying reality is found in the shared subject matter of the text. So you're free to let these historical ruptures and differences, you're free to let them stand as they are in the text. But what, they, what, what they're unified by is, is the shared subject matter, theological subject matter of scripture, not you know, a shared authorial consciousness. So Matthew had exactly the same idea that Hosea did, you know, and that unifies him. Or even a seamless kind of literary movement from creation to fall to Israel on into Jesus and the church and, you know, like Bartholomew and Goheen might do in drama of scripture. I think because figural reading works with juxtaposition rather than trying to overcome it and that and the reason for that is because it takes its bearings from scriptures theological subject matter, at least on my reading of it it's free to let these historically discrete context stand as they are, but also realize they've been brought together by an integrating logic and affiliation that finally brings them to speak of one reality. So I don't know if I did the best justice to Martin Note, but I think he he was on to that, as Chris points out in Convergences. It just, uh, it, it never really got fully worked out. It came late in his career. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, Don, I mean, it answered the question as well. I, the note thing was a surprise to me. I discovered it through Paul Beauchamp because the book, the, the original book of note is massively about the diachronic. And you would, you know, I read it when I was in graduate school and I, that's what I took away from it. And I didn't read the last chapter where he said, that's all well and good, but, you know, we have to work with what we've got. And for some reason, the Germans in large measure came up to that and then ran away. I mean, Rentorf would be somebody, it seems to me, that took the diachronic and plugged it into a different view of how the Pentateuch emerged and then went to canon, where you read these big volumes now, it's like, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. We're out of work. You know, we, we got nothing to write about if we can't do historical religious reconstruction. And uh, this touches on a point that Don had made earlier about Childs and you know, I look in these big FAT volumes on Isaiah, and there's like there's no citations of the, in the index. The, the child has disappeared from view, and it's kind of it's funny to to me. I, I just I don't know whether it's the Germans who were sort of I'm being, I'm German myself, but whether the Germans kind of felt like they were in the control room, and Childs did some things with their methods that they didn't they they didn't approve of, and they got allergic to the whole idea and ran back to to diversity and his history of religion, dating sources and so forth and so on. And uh, I think if you told them Martin Note didn't, that's not where he was headed, they'd say, you're a liar. Uh, I only, I read the 90% of that book and that is where he was headed. I said, oh, read the last bit. Oh, he was wrong, he was having a bad day. He, he was going to church that morning, had a bad conscience, something like that. And you know, I, I came away from that because I kept quoting Von Rod on this topic in 1970 where he talked about the conjunction of P and P and J. Well, Martin Oak was writing this in 1948. Yeah, that's he was dead by the time Von Rott wrote the the uh, second edition of the Genesis commentary. I'll stop. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Doc. Beth. Beth, can we bring you in here? Maybe um, does this all sound this 1948 stuff and kind of German <laughs> dead Germans? Is that is that a world you want to kind of pull the canonical approach out of? And, and, and set it in another direction, or I don't put words in your mouth, but, but go on. No, it's okay. what I was gonna, what I was gonna say, actually, I, I was thinking about Don, uh, Don's comment about figuration and its in, in, integrative properties. One of the things I think is interesting is that another direction that I've seen some people use canonical criticism is really in questions of metaphor and, um, and that sort of the thematic ways of getting at some of that biblical theology. And so I think, I think I would say that um, and I, I obviously am indebted to all of the long history, including the 1940s writings. Um, but I think what I think is interesting is some of the recent work that um, that does do integrative work that would stand alongside uh, canonical approaches, um, but does that with by way of asking questions about the, the movement of metaphor across, for example, within the Old Testament or as you move from the old to the new. Um, and what is that? integration show us about the way that people were thinking uh, in terms of a final form or in terms of the, the interconnection of different parts of the canon. And so, uh, so it comes at maybe a different angle, but I think that that's also a valuable piece. I think, Beth, you're right. I think you see this in Isaiah studies where uh, 
uh, a crass understanding of return from exile dominated the reading of, of Isaiah 40 to 55. And increasingly, people move in a more metaphorical direction. And they say, there's not the, we don't doubt that, that, that people were out there and they came back. Whether they were all in Babylon, we don't know. But if you're going to talk about the way of the Lord, you're talking about a spiritual reality, a metaphorical context. And I think, I think the field has moved in that direction, uh, either under the influence of Childs or simply because they're, they've gotten to be, in my view, closer mm -hmm. readers of the material. Well, what I found is that a lot of times as I was doing just research, looking to see where is Childs being referenced, but not by people who claim to be canonical, is that you actually find Childs in small pieces referenced by a lot of those scholars, even if they're not taking on the, the perspective wholesale, which says that there is still an influence. It's just they might not describe it in those terms, which I think you said in your paper as well. Yeah, I'm struck. Oh, there's a lot of ink being spilled on the end of Deuteronomy, this whole question of do we have six books, seven books, eight books of Deuteronomistic history? And Eckhart Otto and these people are all writing on this, and they never mention that Childs had basically talked about all this in the 70s and Stephen Chapman, his student. Now, why? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. I guess that's what, partly what I was trying to say is that maybe it's just a, the term was had a certain allergy. You know, a lot of people just never liked the word canonical. I think we get that. I mean, it lists, I mean, Ron Clements, he said, Charles is really right about Isaiah, but this canonical thing is nuts. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? And uh, it, it, the, the word just never worked. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of bring in a last question, and I'm going to point it in Mark Ginnellet's direction uh, and Chris as well. Uh, and I know, Mark, you're going to kind of, if you could perhaps segue into kind of your uh, special bit that you're going to do um, after, right after this. But perhaps before you do that, you could just maybe give me your opinion. It kind of, I think you've got Don Collett to blame for this question. And that's why I'm giving it to you. Uh, that it says here, uh, how can we think in terms of a fully, I think it's not fully figured biblical theology, it's a fully figural uh, biblical theology um, that's, that's going to be useful for preaching. So Mark, here's an easy question for you. A fully figural biblical theology for preaching. Can you, can you work with that? I was actually going to ask that question to Chris. He mentions it in his paper as an indication of, of the way in which some of these comprehensive projects like Child said are, are really difficult to achieve. I wonder if they're in the rearview mirror, so to speak. And even in his own book, Convergences, I think, you know, Chris's point of entry to think about biblical theology is through the lectionary. That itself is a species of a, of a, of a, of a kind of homiletical instinct, trying to think through the text and the way in which text associate with one another. And I'll just give an example of this. I don't know if I mentioned this to Chris in an email or not, but I was working through convergences in his chapter on Beauchamp, thinking about the relationship between the dead Egyptians on the shoreline in Exodus 14, and how Beauchamp thinks of that through the images of the way in which that metaphor is picked up within the New Testament and thinking of it in Christological terms, Jesus as, a, as figuratively represented in the dead Egyptians on the shoreline. I mean, that that itself is, is a, you know, is a kind of biblical theology that works itself out in, in homiletical presentation that I guess it depends on your, you know, ecclesial specific location, whether or not you're doing lectionary readings, but it's, it does force one to think about the way in which texts across the Testaments are talking to one another on the level of shared subject matter. Yeah, I would have said, um, I've done some teaching of preaching, and I would have said, you know, when you're reaching for an anecdote, um, you know, my fossil collection and what it reminded me of as I reflect on the Sermon on the Mount. Why don't you decide that there, there are other biblical illustrations that you could use rather than your own? Now, a, a lectionary teased that up, but of course, all good preachers did that just because they knew the Bible well. And so they knew about the dead Egyptians and whether it was a sign for that day or not, they might motor over there and use it. You know, you read, Spur you hear, listen to Spurgeon and it's just, he's explosive. And he doesn't know what he's doing. You know, that's the other beauty. I sometimes I read Bart on Job and I think, well, my God, the man says it's it's three o'clock in the morning. His pen is hot. He, he doesn't, I don't think he has a clue what he's writing on Job, but it's, it's shimmering. You know, it's, it's absolutely genius. And that Beauchamp has a little of the same small print of Bart. And that if that isn't preachable, I don't know what is. I, you know, maybe I go to the wrong kind of churches. I mean, that they're, they're, it's really stunning. Well, well, thank you, and thanks for those who gave uh, questions. I'm sorry we haven't had time for, for all of them, but um, I think we've done pretty well. 
And I know that you came here not so much to hear your own questions, but to hear the wisdom of our panelists. And we're very grateful to them and to Chris particularly for, for handling those and for getting a good discussion going. We could go on, but we're getting towards the end of our time. So I want to hand over to Mark General at this point. Mark. Great, thank you. Um, it's really a great pleasure to conclude our event today with the presentation of a festschrift in honor of you, Professor Christopher Seitz. Now, the editors and contributors to this volume have eagerly anticipated this day, Chris, and, and take great delight in expressing our admiration and our appreciation to you. Um, the volume is entitled uh, The Identity of Israel's God and Christian Scripture. Terry, do we have the slide with that cover available? Thank you. There it is. And I had the privilege of serving as an editor on this project alongside Don Collett, Mark Elliott, and Ephraim Radner. It was a real joy working with these colleagues and friends. I, I should also be quick to mention on the, on the front end of this presentation, Chris, the editor's deep indebtedness uh, to your former student and our, our panelists today, Andy Witt. Andy did an enormous amount of heavy lifting, editing these essays and forming, formatting them according to SBL standards. And Andy, the editors uh, say in the acknowledgements that this book would not have been completed without you, and we really mean it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Terry, you can take that slide down now if you wish. Um, Chris, this, this day has been long in the making. The idea for this festschrift began in 2016 and took flight in 2017. The hope was to honor you on your 65th birthday, but that, that didn't quite work out. Um, the editors of this volume cast our net wide when soliciting contributors uh, to the book. It was our desire to have a healthy mix of your former students and your peers in the field. We were thrilled when very few declined our request to contribute to this volume, resulting in 24 contributors and a volume of some uh, breadth and substance. The scope of the Feshrift is a testament to the fertility of your own mind and work and its wide ranging influence. And the editors and I couldn't be more pleased with the final product. We believe this volume is a fitting tribute, tribute to you, Chris. We've all been blessed by your scholarship, mentorship, and friendship. And if I wasn't on a dry campus here in the South, I'd lift a glass to you and your lovely wife, Elizabeth. Now, let me, while everyone's still here, express our deep gratitude to all the contributors. You all have been very patient with us as we sought to land the plane of this book. Like so many uh, projects of this scope, there was certainly some turbulence along the way and some rerouting of flight patterns, but, but not because of the contributors and your thoughtful and timely efforts to honor Chris with your essays. So thank you all very much. We, we are in your debt. Um, Terry, if you'll pull up the slide of contributors of the, the, uh, the table of contents, I'll, I'll read through these. The volume will have a dedication uh, page that reads essays in honor of Christopher Seitz. And then the volume begins, as you see, with a tribute uh, to Chris from his former student, Claire Matthews McGinnis. Um, Daniel Driver uh, gives us a reflection really on sort of on Seitz's intellectual location and the discipline, God and scriptural proximity, notes on the contributions of Christopher Seitz, and a special thanks go out uh, to Dan Driver's hard work on this volume with this chapter and the one that he writes uh, uh, further uh, down the way on the table of contents. Dan did some uh, heavy lifting here and we're very grateful. Don Collett put together um, this bibliography of, of Chris's work. And then we have our first uh, essay, The Exegesis of the One God by Ephraim Radner, The Character of the Biblical God by Mark Elliott, The How as well as the What, Canonical Formatting and Theological Interpretation by Stephen Chapman, The Tabernacle Narrative is Christian Scripture from Gary Anderson, the God of the Spirits of All Flesh, number 16, 22, 27, 16, Nathan McDonald. On Difficulty in Psalm 2, Dan Driver again. The Psalter, Worship, and Worldview, Jamie Grant. Creation and Contingency in Kohelet, Raymond Ben Leuven. Jezreel, The Day of Visitation in Hosea, the Book of the Twelve, as Character History, Don Collett. With Hosea Penuel, The Interface of Ontology and Tropology, Mark Janolette. In time of tumult you, tumult, you remembered to have compassion, form critical treatments of Habakkuk 3 by Leslie Dimson. From anointed to anointing ones, Joshua, Zerubbabel, and the function of Zechariah 4, 6b through 10a and the visions of Zechariah from Robert C. Cashow. 
um, Theologie aus Text Bausteinen, das Prophetisch Profil der Chronistischen Gottesrede by Georg Steins. My apology to all the German speakers. The per se voice of the Old Testament and the gospel according to Matthew, abiding witness and recontextualization in the Torah and the New Covenant by Jonathan Pennington. The risen Jesus' sovereignty over time and the Logos conceptuality, origin, identity, and time in John 20, 24 to 29 by Neil MacDonald. On reading with stereoptic vision, figural exegesis and history in John 9, Joseph Mangina. The voice of John in the canonical edition of the New Testament, David Trobisch. Paul and the Torah framing the Christian, the question Christianly, Grant McCaskill. Figured in, non-literal reading, the rule of faith in Galatians 4, Catherine Green McCrate. James and Jude as bookends to the Catholic Epistle Collection, Darian Lockett. Searching for Christ in all the scriptures, preaching backward and forward, Annette Brownlee. The Theological Roots of Modern Conservatism, or Rusty Reno, Theology, Reality, and Israel's God, a reflection on the calling of a biblical theologian uh, from Ross of Blackburn. We, again, are so grateful to the contributors for their hard work on this volume and are, and are very excited to release this book uh, in, into the academic and, and theological world. Uh, in conclusion, years ago, James Crenshaw wrote a, a helpful bibli a biography of Gerhard von Rod. Crenshaw situated, situated von Rod within his academic context and training. We follow von Rod from his student days to his professorship at Heidelberg, and along the way, Crenshaw offered readers a capable outline of von Rod's life and with, a, with a really useful entry to the broad, broad contours of his work. Brevard, Ch Brevard Childs, however, thought the same of Crenshaw's biography and said as much in a review of it, but something too was missing in Childs's estimation. And I'm quoting him here. Probably those scholars who are privileged to know von Rod personally will come away with some feelings of incompleteness. The full dimension of his unusual personality tends to get lost in, in the description of his works, says Childs. Crenshaw's presentation of von Rod the man struck Childs as colorless when apparently for those who knew him, his person was round and robust. The sermons, the stuff of homiletical legend. The magnetism of the man seemed lost in Crenshaw's presentation. Admittedly, what Childs felt was missing from the biography is in fact a difficult feature to deliver. You know, one had to experience von Rod in the flesh and unfortunately von Rod no longer roamed the earth. The contributors to this volume, however, have experienced you, Chris, in person. If there are stuffy academics out there, Christopher Seitz is their antipode. His presence fills the classroom or the seminar. So many of us crammed into these settings to watch him in action. Quick, capacious, energetic, inquisitive, bull dogged, and all of this intermingled with uproarious laughter. One of the contributors to this volume once pro compared Professor Seitz's lecturing and seminar style to a jazz musician. Watch and enjoy it, he said to me one time, but don't try to imitate it. How could we? There's only one of him, and the features mentioned here only reflect his professional life. Sites his marriage to Elizabeth, his love of sporting dogs, his priesthood in the church, and, of and a host of other features of Sites' existence attest to a life lived full and well. For those of us who studied under Professor Sites, we remain grateful to have been caught in his gravitational force. As Hebrew reminds us, we give thanks for those who delivered the word of God to us. So Chris, congratulations. And we hope this volume brings you and Elizabeth great joy. Thank you so much. I've, you've got to let me say thank you, thank you, and thank you again. A lot of work goes into these. And Mark, that was a lovely set of statements. I've uh, lived in the classroom with you all. And um, obviously, it's just such a blessing to handle the, the things of God. and and. Uh, we've we've uh, got to know you as human beings and followed you in your career and um, no one loves people in life more than I do if I, I'll meet them I'll let you know but uh, I'm just enormously grateful and Ephraim for helping organize this day and for your contribution to the book and Mark and Don and, and uh, Mark Genelette in particular uh, thank you and I know we're pressed for time this is a strange Format. I must say, I don't like looking at myself when I talk. I find it a little off-putting. Uh, 
I remember, can I just say one little thing? You know, I was thinking about Childs this morning. I went to stay with them once shortly before he died and they put me up in his, uh, he had a little office. This is in upstate New York where Anne had a home, very modest. And uh, they had a bed for me uh, to sleep in, They're very primitive. The Childs were very, they had plenty of money, but they didn't, they didn't lavish it on anything. And he had his little desk there. He had a, he had a, a can with sharpened pencils, an Olivetti typewriter that the key stuck, and he made his own rubber bands, and he had equipment out there to bind books. And I was thinking this morning, given our technology, that stuff is like cave paintings <laughs> nowadays. We've, he, he would, the very idea of this <laughs> would have him flee in horror. Uh, he didn't have a computer, you know, he didn't, he didn't do any of these things. I tried to get him to buy one so he could talk to his kids. And he said, if I ever do that, I'll go down to the library in Chautauqua and use theirs. And sadly, he, he didn't make it that long. But wow, what, a, what an accomplishment. I don't know. I hope we get back to normal. I don't, this isn't my idea of a lot of fun, but I'm certainly very grateful. Thank you, Ephraim. Hi, Chris. It's a delight to be here and celebrate the Feshrift that's coming in your honor. I also want to thank you so much for the intellectual work you've done on the canon and the relationship of canon to Christian theology across the full range of your career. For the last couple of decades, every time I teach the introduction to the Old Testament to either undergraduates or graduate students, I always require them to write a 10 to 12 page paper on the subject, who is Emmanuel? And the only source they are to use is your commentary on Isaiah 1 to 39. It's a fantastic pedagogical exercise that the students universally love and benefit from. It represents, I think, so well, the type of tough exegetical work you're so good at and it's extraordinarily important theological uh, appropriation. Thank you so much for your work. Best wishes to you. Congratulations, Chris. I'm really excited to be a part of this. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution, your investment, especially uh, in the Scripture and Theology Seminar back in St. Andrew's days. Uh, those moments really shaped me and my interest in the Catholic epistles and canonical formation uh, really flow from those times. Uh, hope that you are celebrated today. We, we really appreciate you. So grateful for your contribution. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much for your friendship and mentorship to me. And thanks, too, for all the great conversations we've had over the years, including that one we had just around this time last year in South Carolina with the raccoons playing in the yard as we set out <laughs> on your back porch. You know, with so many other people, I consider you to be a major influence on how I understand the Old Testament. But you've also decisively shaped how I understand the New Testament as well. One of the great delights of my professional career was working with you on the Colossians commentary for Brazos. And in that first section of the commentary where you talk about understanding Colossians in light of the Pauline letter collection. That played a really decisive role in helped me understanding the letter of Colossians and also Paul's letters and even the New Testament more generally. Just want to take a moment then and just to thank you for that work and thank you for your work in general and to thank you once again for what you've meant to me as a, a growing scholar in Christian theology. Kudos to you. Chris, greetings from Cambridge, and it's a real delight to see you being honoured with a Feshrift, and I'm really pleased to be part of it as well. Writing the article just brought back uh, many great memories of the time that we were together in St Andrews. I learned an enormous amount from you, and um, I'm very pleased to have spent those years with you to have been involved in the Scripture and Theology Seminar in St Andrews, and just really to have been able to see the ways that your mind thought and to have learned uh, a great deal from all that you had to say and the ways that you were thinking. 
I imagine that you will be uh, scaling down some of your activities, um, although it's really hard for me to imagine you doing that given the great amount of intellectual energy that you have. I hope that that is really going to continue. Um, it will be hard to imagine uh, a world in which you're not making really important contributions to Old Testament studies and to theology more broadly. So um, when I get home this evening, I'm going to raise a glass to you um, and uh, toast you and uh, look forward to uh, many more years of important and significant contributions. So enjoy uh, the seminar with everyone else. And um, I may not be able to be with you. I'll have to see how things are at home. But um, if not, uh, I really hope that goes uh, very well indeed. Hello, Chris. I was going to say greetings from Scotland, uh, but we did in fact meet uh, at St Andrews University some uh, 20 years ago, and I'm always uh, you know, very grateful for that. Um, let's continue our conversations, and because um, and, um, uh, I always find your uh, feedback of, of great benefit. I hope you enjoy the essays, and congratulations on this fish riff. Bye. My thanks to you, Chris, and my thanks to God for you. Throughout your long career and wonderful career, you have studied, you have delighted in, you have guarded, you have commended the oracles of God, entrusted to you, it seems, with a very special grace. Over these years, you've been a wonderful friend, a good colleague, a great teacher, and a fellow minister in the sometimes difficult service of a church. And I'm very grateful for all these things and pray that there will be many more years to come of them. And the Lord Jesus Christ shower you with rich blessings. Hey, Chris, I just wanted to say congratulations and just express my appreciation again for the way you've impacted my thinking over the last 20 years or so, as well as your kindness and friendship to me over those years as well. So congratulations. Very happy for you on this day. Congratulations, Professor Seitz. Congratulations on your fest trift and on a productive and illuminating career. Contributors to this volume will have met you and come to your work in a variety of ways. I myself came to the University of St. Andrews in 2004, where, under Nathan McDonald's supervision, I started my first degree in divinity. In my first semester there, I bought and read a copy of Figured Out, 2001, uh, my notes here are dated to December 2004. And in this book, I found you to be suggesting answers to questions that I did not even know I needed or wanted to be asking. Uh, the book was instrumental in my decision to continue in this field. I came for an MPhil, and I stayed on for a PhD. It was sometime thereafter, still at St. Andrews, that I read Zion's Final Destiny, 1991, and was again deeply impressed. I don't uh, have the dust jacket for this anymore, but it was from that that I learned that you used to wear a beard. <laughs> uh, I, uh, this book did as much as anything, the content of this book did as much as anything I've ever read to convince me of the value of what Childs calls the depth dimension, that it's a dimension worth thinking about, grappling with, and trying to come to terms with. I was glad when the editors of this fest shrift asked me if I would like to write an overview of your work. I said I would, and I started immediately by rereading your work straight through and picking up some of the titles I missed. For the first time, I read uh, Theology and Conflict, the published version of your dissertation. It was an instructive exercise to work straight through and a good reminder of why I'm grateful for your many contributions. I'm grateful for the rigor you exhibit, for the questions that you push and the boundaries, and for the tremendous creativity that is so often on display. So, from my basement office in Halifax, Nova Scotia, thank you and congratulations. Hello, Professor Seitz. Allow me to add my congratulations to those of your colleagues on the occasion of the publication of your Feshrift. I am delighted to be included in the book honoring you. To my congratulations, I also want to add my thanks. You have been a wonderful mentor to me and to many other students. Your seminars were not only a, an example of great erudition, but erudition in the service of penetrating to the heart of the text of the Old Testament and also to what's at stake in the history of the reading of the Old Testament. You modeled generosity and fairness in your reading of other scholars, 
and also in your encouragement and interest in your students' lives and, and in their work at a formative time for them. Again, thank you, congratulations, and best wishes. Hi, Chris, congratulations <laughs> from the Green McCray family. Thank you very much for everything you've done for me, especially teaching me how to read Isaiah. You might not even remember that you were my professor at one point, Hebrew Exegesis of Isaiah. Anyway, thank you very much and wish we could celebrate with you um, and hope you're well. Stay safe. Have a great celebration. Chin chin. L'chaim. Hey there, Chris. You and I go way back to the tail end of the glory days at Yale. Um, and I've really appreciated the way that you've carried forward uh, the legacy of Hans Frey, George Lindbeck, and especially Bavard Childs in your work as a scholar and as a writer of commentaries and other theological works. Um, you've been a kind of embodiment of the very idea of theological interpretation of scripture that we hold up as a kind of model here at Wycliffe College. Um, you've been a great contributor to the life of the TST. You've enhanced our offerings in Bible. You've directed uh, a whole list of fine dissertations. And, uh, and you've been a great colleague and supportive friend um, in the life of the college. You've been there at our faculty meetings, a kind of a Kohelet like uh, voice of wisdom and prudence, uh, sometimes reminding us of the vanity of our many words and, uh, and just contributed to the life of a faculty. Um, you've also brought a kind of zest and fun and joie de vivre uh, to your uh, work among us. I still remember the time and my kids remember the time um, after chapel one evening, when you showed them how to use pogo sticks and you were hopping around like mad and I swear I think you were having more fun than they were. So thanks for uh, this great time together. Um, I wish you all the best for your scholarly endeavors in the future. All the best to Elizabeth and uh, I hope to see you in person before too long. Blessings. Oh, that was outstanding. What a surprise. Oh, oh am I muted? Am I? No, you're not, but you bring it to an end. That's a super, super, what a, that, that's worth the whole thingy from you. you <laughs> that was a great idea. Here I was talking about the limits of the technology and you go, boy, it giveth and it taketh away. It giveth, doesn't it? I mean, that's really super. That's super. Well, it's a great idea suggested by uh, Steve Hugo and by Terry Spratt themselves. So thank them for that as well. So listen, folks, um, we are at the end of our webinar now. We want to thank you, uh, Professor Seitz. We want to thank our, our uh, panelists, um, uh, Don, Beth, Andy, and Mark, and Mark again for facilitating so wonderfully the questions. Um, again, thanks to Terry, who's behind the scenes. We're ending. We will be having another uh, webinar, or perhaps in person, we'll see what God gives us, uh, colloquium in May. And so stay tuned for that. We're going to be talking specifically about, in this case, the future of theological interpretation more broadly of scripture. So stay tuned for that. As we end, uh, I want to let those who are part of this webinar, and thank you so much for, for being with us, uh, you should have been sent, each of you who registered, a Zoom link if you'd like to stay on for some social conversation with some of the other participants in the uh, webinar. So take a look at your mailbox for that. Once again, thank you. God bless you all and have a wonderful rest of your day or evening.